Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. I would like to thank all of you for joining me. Um, for the new subscribers, thank you so much. And for the support of the past subscribers, I am so incredibly grateful. So thank you all for giving me this opportunity. First things first, um, I did graduate school last Friday and it was pretty difficult um, to last two weeks at this ripe old age, <laughs> um, it was a challenge. And uh, sitting on my desk, um, here is the binder from my school, and look how much information I had to learn and all my notes and all my tests. And um, the best part is in this orange folder, we all know that orange is my favorite color, um, is this awesome certificate from the auction school showing that I did graduate from auctioneer school. I go to take my auctioneer test um, probably in the middle part of January or in the middle part of February, hopefully January. So after that, I'll be a certified auctioneer, which I never thought I would do in my life. But here I am learning a new trade and uh, super exciting. Uh, and I feel like I left the class with uh, 10 new incredible friends. And um, the teacher, Professor Mark, was uh, fantastic and shared a lot of personal experiences, which I'll eventually share some things with you um, down the road. Um, the desk is completely filled. Uh, first things first, in terms of a, a great big thank you, um, I received this box in the mail. Um, and this is the second time I videoed this today because the first time I had a little bit of a breakdown over this. An unexpected box and an unexpected gift. Um, her name is Debbie Copel, and I would like to get Debbie's information um, if uh, she'll allow me to give it out eventually. I would put it on my community tab. Debbie sent me um, a, a two-page letter. Um, and the first thing that I noticed in the box was um, these um, hand crocheted, or I guess um, knitted, but um, amazing hand warmers. And with the size of my rings, they're, I can't wear normal gloves. <laughs> they just don't work for this guy. And look at how cool these are. I got it in um, an off-white, um, but my two favorite colors are black and charcoal gray, or in the gray family. And she made me a matched pair of these incredible gray ones. And I'll tell you what, so incredibly comfortable and I love them. Um, I'm gonna absolutely wear them. And I love them because I can still wear my rings and not have a problem um, because like I said, gloves don't fit this guy. So Debbie, thank you so much. And she sent me two stones. One's a Herkimer diamond from New York, a rock crystal, and a beautiful banded agate that's in the bottom of this box. Um, a beautiful banded agate that I would like to make into a pendant or a ring. So um, th thank you so much, Debbie. Um, but the one that got me that uh, I had to re-record was uh, the most unexpected. And, and it was this, and let me put this down here to get this out of my way. Um, it was this. It's it's a purse um, that Debbie made me, custom-made purse of the Bull Terrier Zito that I used to own. And um, uh, Tanya, I, I, I always mention Tanya because <laughs> I'm addicted to Tanya. She's addicted to jewelry. So uh, my affection for Tanya is very apparent. Um, uh, but if you're not familiar with her, please go over to her channel. You'll be absolutely amazed. Um, anyways, I saw Debbie on Tanya's channel and um, would always say hello to her and would always greet her. But she made Tanya a large elephant um, purse, like a, a big, great big elephant purse, and I fell in love with it. Like, I fell madly in love with it, and so I had said that I would love to have one of Debbie's originals. And um, lo and behold, um, Tanya, who is sneaky, <laughs> but in, a, in the best way possible, Tanya asked me for photographs of Zito, and she said that they were for um, her daughter Tasha, so she could show Tasha what my dog looked like. Anyways, Tanya, um, Debbie had asked for the photos of Zito, and um, and Tanya supplied her with those, and she made this purse that looks exactly like what Zito looked like. Uh, and when I received it and I opened the box, the emotion that I had, um, unbelievable, because as friend mail from um, someone who's a complete stranger, um, but not anymore, someone who I consider a very dear friend, um, and that's happening with most of my viewers, I feel um, very 
um, attached to certain people. Um, so Debbie, you really, really, really touched my heart and you changed my day that day. I've had some rough days lately um, and uh, some emotional days, but she constructed this completely by hand. It looks exactly like Zito because he had a crooked ear. Um, he, he had an ear that didn't stand up because uh, Bull Terrier's ears are supposed to stand up and one of his ears folded forward like this. And um, then she signed it like, you know, Weiss, um, I'm, I'm not sorry, uh, I'm sorry, not Weiss, um, I'm drawing a blank, um, um, the Mohair Bears uh, from Germany, but um, they have a, um, Stife, they have a tag in the ear, and um, Debbie puts a tag with leather markings in uh, her creation's ears, and she used vintage clip-on earrings for the eyes, and um, crocheted and um, accentuated the nose. It looks exactly like Zito's nose. And then vintage buttons where you can open the purse to put things in. And look at how cute the tail is. I mean, this thing is just the cutest thing that I've ever seen in my entire life. I love it so incredibly much. And Debbie, you um, really did touch me um, at, right in my heart, right where um, my soul is. And um, from a perfect stranger to um, me, um, you are a dear friend, and uh, Debbie, I thank you so much. Um, just incredible. I could talk about that forever. Um, first friend mail, and it blew my mind. Um, I am just so incredibly grateful. On that note, I want to give a special shout out to Gigi. You are um, a rock star. You're a bright light on a dark sky. If you guys haven't been to Gigi's channel, um, it's Gigi's Gems and Jewels, and I had to write that down so I would remember it. Gigi's Gems and Jewels is her channel, and um, I know that you will find it um, refreshing, honest, and um, it's it's just perfection. So, Gigi, I, I love you. I love all of my viewers and all of my supporters. Um, one that stuck out again last week just because the message was so um, um, poignant because the day that I was having, Susan Anthony, I, I don't really know much of you, but Susan, um, thank you so much, and Tamara. Um, Tamara, I, I don't want to ruin the magic that we share, but, um, I just want you to know that, um, I truly do adore you very much and I'm with you at all times. Um, and I truly mean that, um, you have not only become, um, um, a viewer, but, um, a dear friend and, um, I love you. I absolutely love you. So, um, thank you for finding me and thank you for your constant support to all of my viewers and all of my subscribers. I am literally nothing without you. There wouldn't be a reason for me to do this. So again, thank you for touching my life and um, leaving an impression on me and allowing me to share. I um, love you. I absolutely love you. Um, on to the box of jewelry that I got from Don Scott Antique Show. We're going to go through this in just a little bit. Um, I'm going to take it to the light box um, briefly because there's so much on the desk and I don't want to ramble on today. Bakelite bracelets. I bought the whole stack. Some very um, unusual ones and some more common, but the colors are great and they were very affordable. They're not going to stay with me. Those are definitely for resale um, because I simply have too many at this point. So those are all for um, bought for resale and they're all genuine Bakelite um, and just very pretty. Um, a piece of coal pottery, C-O-L-E pottery. I used to collect this uh, way back when, when people didn't really know what it was. Uh, the glazes and the forms were always so very uh, arts and crafts or mission, but beautifully done, American art pottery. And this one was very affordable. It was only $15, but I loved the form. I loved the way the glaze was on the surface and um, just a beautiful thing in great condition. Onto a more unusual version that I'm not sure exactly what I have, but I do know that it's Art Deco, um, and it is very, very, very streamlined, very graphic. Um, again, I'm gonna go with early American or German, and I know that's a big swing of where it was made, but there's a reason for that. I'm not gonna leave out either place. It is signed on the bottom, and I hope that the camera can pick that up without looking at me. I don't think it's going to, but signed on the bottom, and um, very unusual form and very unusual treatment on the surface. Extremely Art Deco, 1920, 1930. Onto a piece that I'm gonna have to research quite a bit, and maybe some viewers out there can help me with this. So it is a bronze temple bell. It's clearly Chinese. It does have quite a bit of age, would have been hung 
from this, like this, it is missing its internal clapper that would make the noise. The original finding is on the inside there, and the oxidation on the surface and the patination to the bronze is incredible. And the inscription, um, it does translate and mentions a uh, dowager, um, not also not just a dowager, but also uh, Wan Li as a time period, W A N L I, and um, that time period was late 1600s to the I believe mid 1700s. Um, I'm going on memory again here, so. Um, please understand that that's as close as I'm going to get without looking it up. Um, but the translation, it did have a lot of information that um, Google did pick up and did translate. So um, on to the fact that that inscription may have been added at a later time. So the bell is definitely old. Is the inscription original to it? I don't know. If it is, this is very important. If it's added later, it's still important, but maybe not as important. Normally, the characters are cast in place. They are um, cast in place, and so that has me a little concerned that um, those characters are added later, um, but I have a ton of research to do on that. But if anyone else has any information on this and you have um, anything that you can be concrete with about with me, please reach out to me in the comments and let me know um, because I do feel that this could be something relatively important. Um, and I, it was a very moderate price because the gentleman did not know what it was. Um, On to a piece of art pottery. I bought this at an antique mall down in Springfield. I loved the color. I loved the form. I loved the profile. I really loved the craft. It is porcelain clay body, like it should be, and it is signed very faintly inside here. I'll have to do some research on the artist, but really beautiful, big um, celery green crystals with a halo of like a steely gray, really, really beautiful, and decorated with the crystals 360 degrees. But wow, just just a wow piece. Uh, and again, moderately priced and had to come home with me. On to the uh, insane version. This was also bought at a Springfield Antique Mall, which I will get into the mall in future videos, um, owned by two really fantastic gentlemen. And this is a beautiful, beautiful electric blue crystal and glaze vase. It is signed on the bottom. I do know the artist, but there's a secondary mark I have to do some research on. So one artist may have been responsible for the form, and another artist may have been responsible for the glaze. That's completely possible. And it is dated on the bottom 1976. So that was proudly made in 1976. And what an amazing, amazing form with a beautiful vessel in remarkable condition and then covered in this electric micro crystalline glaze vase. And a micro crystalline glaze, not an easy thing to accomplish and most certainly not 365 degrees in this much of an electric blue. So I, I just, I, I love this beyond love this and my heart skipped a beat when I found it. I had seen it the last time I was there and I kind of forgot to go back for it because I was overwhelmed by other pieces and I was so incredibly grateful and very surprised that it was still there like two months later. So um, it was meant to be and a lot of times that's what happens with things. On to an Eckholt art glass paperweight. This is by Eckholt. It is signed on the bottom, and I believe it's dated 1990. Yes, it is. So it's signed Eckholt there and dated 1990. And this is a magnum paperweight based on size. So it's a magnum. It's great big. And um, Eckholt was known for this opalescent blue and controlled bubble design. This one is super cool because it can sit like this or it can lay down like this. So it could be a lay down or it's a stand up. But boy, is this that really super cool. Is that not? I, I just, uh, I love it. And I have about 30, about 25 or 30 Echo paperweights. Uh, and they're all quite magical because he was a master of art glass. Just incredible. Um, I do have some Christmas decorations on, on the table that I bought. 
They are from 1974. They're the honeycombs, so they unfold, but they're in such great condition that they were uh, going to have to have. And this one is actually in its original plastic bag, uh, and it's the Santa. And when he folds out, his hands and belt are in place. So um, just a really cool thing to be in its bag. And these are only $10 a piece. So uh, those, were again, were, made me very happy. And something that wasn't collected years ago, but now is revered because being paper and ephemeral um, or so fugitive, uh, they're usually not in very good condition, but these two were just uh, fantastic condition. On to, oh, I almost forgot this little guy. So this I bought uh, about a month and a half ago. It is a Vienna bronze rabbit and his gesture and his detail and his fur down to the feet detail on the bottom. He is, he or she is signed right there. And I really think that it's Franz Bergman. It's difficult to make out the mark. It is reminiscent of Bergman's mark, but this is definitely 1900. 1900, 1905, it's not a contemporary recast. Um, beautiful execution on the fur and the eyes. Look at the eyes and the ears and the fact that that rabbit is totally ready to take off. <laughs> that rabbit is ready to run. So I really loved the face. I really loved the gesture. And I was most certainly taken by the detail in the fur. Um, and uh, Vienna bronzes are most known for that most known for the most incredible detail. And I did a short feed on some of the Vienna, Vienna bronzes that I already owned. Um, this, oh boy, I could talk about this for quite a while too. This is Rosenthal Netter. Um, it is signed on the bottom here. And when these labels are missing or not intact, sometimes these are attributed to Batosi or Raymore. There's nothing wrong with that because in the Italian family, but this is definitely Rosenthal Netter, retailed Rosenthal Netter. And then there is the Made in Italy um, uh, paper label as well, Made in Italy, but really, really strong, strong coloration and orange, yellow, and metallic gold. And these used to sell very moderately, 50 to $60. The last one I saw listed like this, in this size, and in this good a condition, was in the five to $600 range. I think that they're gonna continue to go up because there weren't that many produced, and the ones that were produced were kind of forgotten about. So as they're rediscovered, I do think the price is gonna maintain and probably go up a little bit. Um, but again, uh, I can never guarantee anything in this business because uh, I've seen some wild things happening, but beautifully executed and uh, such a bold, a, a, a nod to Art Deco and a nod to minimalist at its best with decoration. But uh, I, I, I loved it and uh, I was quite astounded by that. And it wasn't very expensive. I think I paid 45 or $50 for it. Uh, and again, I would think uh, between four and 600 would be a fair going rate for it. So there was money to be made on that. Um, and then a piece of art glass that I believe is I believe it's either Czech or Italian. I'm going to lean more towards Italian in construction. There's an applied corkscrew lip at the top here. And the form, the bulbous form and the applied foot uh, encased glass. So you have this encased and modeled glass inside of clear. Very Italian in terms of technique. But really, really good coloration. Really good form. Um, and a ground and polished pontal on the bottom. And a ground and polished Foot. So sure sign of quality when you see that. And again, this was only $5. So although not incredibly, incredibly important, still worth at least um, a softly attributed 185 And if it's a more important maker that I find out later, could be 250 285 um, There was a vase that just sold. Uh, it was in a Google feed that came through on my phone. And it was acquired at Goodwill, I think, for not very much money. And it sold for, um, I believe it was like, uh, several hundred thousand dollars. And it was Italian. Um, and I forget who the maker was on it because I really wasn't paying attention. It was early morning before my coffee. So I'll have to revisit that on Google and uh, be sure to pay attention for sure. But that just happened. On to another piece of mid-century art glass. At first, I thought this was contemporary, made within the last maybe 10, you know, five or 10 years. It is not. It's absolutely mid-century modern. It's a bottle form, which is 
very, very, very 50s, 60s. Uh, and this white is applied on the surface. So this actually has like a tooth to it that the threading is applied to this um, almost clear glass. But again, the glass isn't clear. It's kind of this smoky gray, grayish blue. Uh, again, a ground pontal. So the pontal is where this was basically blown for, from, and then it was broken off, and then that pontal was then ground down and then uh, semi-polished on the bottom of this one. So a sure sign of quality. But the coloration of the base glass and the form was definitely, definitely, definitely vintage, mid-century modern. Very sizable. Uh, this was only $20 at Don Scott. So again, it was absolutely worth the chance because, you know, is it, mm, is it $85 or is it $650? You know, time will tell. <laughs> so that was a moneymaker and just a really beautiful and stunning form. Um, and then I felt since it was white and gray, it would fit in any decor quite perfectly. So there was that. And then uh, the last thing before I hightail it over to the light box, before I lose every single viewer, because it takes me forever to start a video anymore. Um, you asked for it, though. You said you missed me, so here I am. Uh, these are celluloid bangles. And I did add to the stack. So from Don Scott was this one, which is cream and uh, teal rhinestones. And uh, I had the blue ones, the snake I've had for a very long time, the double-headed snake. And then um, the red... Uh, one of my favorites is this one, just really beautifully done. And these are all 1920s. And then I got this one from Don Scott. It's like little, um, almost, it reminded me of Weeping Willow um, leaves with tendrils and then lime green stones on kind of like an apple juice color celluloid. So, um, but just really cool, loaded with sparkle, loaded with class, very timeless. Um, and uh, a collection that I have much more of that we'll get into later. Um, I did want to discuss as well um, my videos that are coming up. I just want to briefly touch on it so you know what's coming. The Good, Better, and Best is going to start very soon. So that's the Good, Better, and Best of a material, a maker, a time period, um, just about anything in my collection. So I'm going to actually show you three examples of each thing and then why they're good, better, and best. So you know what to look for when you're out and about. Um, as to another video, I've been grilled on the polishing, cleaning, and uh, storing items. And I'm going to do a video on that as well, or a multi-part video on that, depending on what the material is. And then the last string of videos that it's going to take me a long time to get through, and it might be a lifetime of videos because I have a lot to say, um, it's going to be the buying guides or the 101s to certain things. And I made a little list, materials, ages, makers, whether it be companies or individuals, and then designs or aesthetics that went with certain time periods. So again, those will be very simplified videos. So we'll give you the visual information that you need to go out when you're at an antique mall, an auction, um, a thrift store, uh, a favorite shop of yours, a resale shop, um, a flea market, garage sale, wherever you are, those guides should help you um, in applying your information rather than just pulling information from online. It, it will be a hands-on, this is what to look for. And it's been my guide um, to being very successful in this business. So I'm going to pause you for right now before I completely lose every single viewer. Thank you so much for your patience with me. The video starts now at 23 minutes. So I'll be right back. Give me one second. I'm going to pause this and I hope I don't erase this like I did the first time. Hold on one second. Okay. Mwah. Be right back. Okay, everybody, I'm back. We're in the light box, and I am remotely refreshed with a quick drink of water. And um, these were the three pieces that I wore to Don Scott, um, and you have all asked, what's my daily wardrobe? So I thought, I'll bring it out, and I'll show you what I wore. This is <laughs> one of the funniest pins I've ever found. It's called a mood swing, <laughs> and it is sterling silver. Uh, it's signed right here, and it was copyrighted, so it was mass-produced but it's sterling silver and there's a little lady on a swing um, and there's a nasty, a bad, an okay, 
a good and a great mood. Um, and when you wear it, these little stays will kind of keep it wherever your daily mood is. And I thought it was incredible and so whimsical. Um, and I am probably one of the moodiest people that's ever been born. So I like to lock it in on the good mood area. So I normally wear her here. If you're in a nasty mood, I recommend you just stay home. <laughs> That's all I can say. Um, but it, it's so whimsical and so cool. Um, and I did wear that to Don Scott. And uh, it was the pin that I wore uh, um, uh, on, that was Friday when we went down there. So then um, this was uh, the other brooch that I had on. And it's just a remarkable, Victor a remarkable Victorian brooch um, made around 18... This is a little difficult to date, but around 1850 to 1860. Um, these are rock crystal, um, and they have the central culet, which would technically make them black dot, um, but they are rock crystal. So you can't say black dot paste because they're not paste stones. They're rock crystal. So there is a difference there. Um, all closed back set. So there is gold on the back, and there is silver on the front, and then a gold star in the center. But look at the light that these stones produce, and um, just a beautiful thing. And when I bought this years ago, uh, it was sold to me as costume and as a rhinestone brooch, and I believe it was maybe $15 or $18. And again, today, because the size of the stones, I wouldn't sell this for less than... I I wouldn't I wouldn't feel comfortable selling less than six hundred. So I would say you know on um, a very generous day I might go five fifty. But uh, I most certainly would regret selling this for anything less than six hundred dollars. Uh, beautiful execution on both the metal and the stones. And then the necklace that I wore. This was in a short of mine. This is Bjorn Wexstrom, and Bjorn Wexstrom designed Princess Leia's necklace in Star Wars. So that kind of melted necklace that Princess Leia. War in the Star Wars movie was constructed out of these shaped, if you wish, medallions or stations, and then they were linked together around the neck to create her necklace. This version is a single kind of melted or biomorphic piece of sterling that was cast and then finished. Um, and then the, the chain is bars that were folded over and then jump rings. So the chain is completely Wexstrom as well. Um, there are several hallmarks back here to, to uh, signify that. And the Bjorn Wexter mark, let me see if I can get in on it because sometimes my camera fights with me so bad. Um, let's see here. Uh, it's trying and can't really hold it that steady, but you can see most of the marks right there. So Laponia, L-A-P-P-O-N-I-A, -P -P the Laponia mark, and then all of the correct hallmarks for Wexstrom. And I think there was one more series of marks. There we go. M m memory served me correct. <laughs> um, hadn't seen this piece for like 15 years, um, but there are more hallmarks there. Um, the large piece that you're seeing here, some people might think it's art glass. It's in fact not. It's acrylic that has been drilled out from behind. There is epoxy resin that filled in the hole where they drilled. So they drilled that out and then altered the inside of this and then painted the inside of it and then sealed it off with acrylic on the back or epoxy on the back. So um, that is hand worked. So each one was individually different. And I'll lay it there so you can kind of get the whole feel for this. What a magnificent modernist masterpiece of uh, silversmithing and also of, um, you know, acrylic um, artisan made piece that uh, really hard to find these days. Um, but Bjorn Wexstrom, one of my favorite makers. I have another one here that um, is by Bjorn Wexstrom. Let me find it real quick. It's right here. And this is the smaller version. I found this um, just very recently, maybe uh, six months, eight months ago. Um, but this is Bjorn Wexstrom as well. A very small acrylic inlay there, sterling silver. Again, same kind of chain, um, same kind of construction, signed on the clasp, and then this kind of um, very Viking-esque shaped medallion. Let me see if I can zoom in on that again. Nope, it's still fighting with me. Uh, nope, it, it, we're not going to be able to read it. But again, by Bjorn Wexstrom. 
and I don't know, my camera's fighting with me today, and it's winning. <laughs> um, so the sterling silver construction, and then again, this acrylic inset with purple inset from behind, um, and really magical uh, talisman in a way, very protective talisman, and uh, a much more feminine size, a much more female version, because it is so much smaller than the other one, um, and much more graceful. So um, some of these have titles like Spaceman, Thor's Hammer, things like that. Uh, so each one has a, um, a name. I just am not familiar enough with uh, those two, what they would have been called. Um, two other pieces that were, sorry, these things are still bagged up with tags on them, but um, this was um, uh, two silver spoons. The person didn't think that they were silver. Let me zoom out a little tiny bit for you. Um, to get the whole spoon in the frame. There we go. And I don't know what's going on with the lighting, but I'm doing my best. This was $3, the windmill moves, and then there's a portrait in the center. They just missed the hallmark, and I think on this one, let me see if I can find it real quick. It's very hidden, um, and maybe... Uh, yeah, here it is, right inside the bowl, and they missed it because the oxidation definitely hid that hallmark from view. So uh, $3, either sterling or 800 silver at this point, and I would probably guess in the 800 silver, um, um, shall you say, content. And then on this one, this was the Viking ships and a very fancy bowl with some pierce work, possibly a bonbon spoon. You know, um, are people going to fight with me on what it was used for? Probably probably will. <laughs> so um, I'll just say a fancy serving spoon, 800 silver for sure. The Viking ship really well detailed. But again, a steal for three bucks, you know, just in metal alone. These are probably between 25 and 30. Do well, probably 25 at least uh, dollars just in silver, um, but really beautiful. And I love the oxidation. So those were a must. And then from the same place, let me put these back from the same place. I got this uh, beautiful Victorian English, likely Birmingham, um, but again, not 100% sure because there's no hallmarks uh, signifying where it came from. Applied Cannonball Border. So that's what that's called. And then two different colors of gold. We've got green gold in the fern leaves, and then this rose gold for like the flower blossoms in between these kind of fern-shaped leaves. So mixed metals. You have sterling silver base, and then um, definitely pure gold or real gold, rose gold and green gold application in this. And it is a locket. The back is in beautiful condition. Condition. And then the bail is original. And then you open it up here. And on the inside, it's missing the fitter ring here. So there may have been hair work underneath glass because that's a pretty deep compartment for just a photograph. And then the fitter ring is still here. So this little ring does lift out. And uh, there would have been either, you know, a sheet of mica or celluloid or glass that would have been over probably a photograph on that side. So um, just remarkable in terms of its craft and design. And it's a very large version. This was only $25. So, you know, again, could I get $125, $165? Absolutely. Could I try for $185? I most certainly can. So um, beautifully executed. And again, you know, Victorian and purist uh, for the Victorian collector. So that was a have to have as well. Um, on to a strand of beads that I bought at the antique mall. Again, are they incredibly, incredibly important? Nope. But were they really awesome and uh, large that I could make a beaded necklace and sell it? Sure. They are turquoise. Um, and they are Chinese. These are not American turquoise. They are from China. And you can tell by the very oversized black matrix, especially in this one, um, Chinese turquoise has this tendency, or I should say most of it, has this tendency to have such an exaggerated matrix that then accentuates the stones. Are these color treated? More than likely, yes. Um, am I 100% sure on that? I'm not 100% sure because I have seen very lush green turquoise and I would question this one because it doesn't look like it was treated because if it was, the dye didn't stay the same all the way through. So that one may not be color treated. But again, I'm not going to get into that because these were only $10 and look how giant that one is. That one by itself 
you know, on a chain would be beautiful. But what I'd like to do with these is then space sterling silver beads in between all of them and then put on a decorative clasp. But again, for $10, it was a have to have because if I went to a gem show, these wholesale would be $50 to $60 on a wholesale level, you know, so uh, dealer to dealer. So did I feel confident at $10? Of course I did. So that was a yes. Um, in the video, I showed this bell uh, and I wanted to give a close up. So if you can give me any information um, at all on age, evaluation, or what exactly this says. So I know there are Chinese experts out there on um, in, in the world of YouTube um, and in terms of collectors. Let me zoom out a little bit more so we can get the whole bell in so you can see the whole form. We'll go right there. And you can see the oxidation and the patination, and you can see that this is very, very old. That surface is not forced. Now, I don't know if the engraving was on originally or was that added later. I just am not 100% sure. On this side, I believe it says something about the fourth day of April in the year of Wan Li. W-A-N-L-I. I believe that's what this side says. This side has been much more difficult to translate for me. And it says something about the Dowager. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what it says. But if anyone else can help me, I would be forever grateful. Thank you so much. Leave it in the comments below. And I most certainly would be able to respond. But look at the surface and the oxidation. I believe that this is a very, very important bell from a temple, a sacred object that definitely needs to find the right home. Um, and I'm willing to do that. I'm, I'm willing to find its permanent home because uh, it definitely needs to be revered um, and it needs to be um, saved for sure. So there's that as well. So if you can give me any information, I'd be grateful. The necklace that I wore in the video uh, when the camera was up was this. This chain is not original to this, so please ignore the chain, but I loved the chain for this. This pendant is by Tapio, Tapio Workala. Um, it's from the 1970s, and it's the most large version I've seen. I saw one on eBay a few years ago, and I believe it sold for around $4,500. I have the matching earrings to this as well. Um, it is sterling silver, and then all of the identification marks are on the top here. Let me zoom in for you so you can see all the goodness of the hallmarks. Look how many hallmarks. Not only the origin, but the date letter, um, the origin, the metal content, um, the artisan mark, and then the 925 mark at the top. And again, um, authentic, old, and look at the way it moves. It bends the light, it moves the light, very hypnotic, and each disc is independent and moves on its own. And I wish I could get a better video of this and better video of the movement, but you can see what this does. And the earrings are the same. They're just about this large. So where this um, medium-sized ring is, the earrings are only about that large and on French wires. But I bought the set years ago in Cleveland at a gallery for $300. Um, and of course, you know, I wasn't exactly sure what I was looking at, but I knew I was in the presence of greatness. I knew that I was uh, in the presence of something really remarkable. So as a silversmith, this really, really, really stuck out to me as something that I wanted and had to have. And then I just added this disc chain just because I felt it mimicked the movement of the central pendant as well. So there's that. And then let me get into the things that I bought for resale. So these are Miriam Haskell earrings. They would be considered A-line. Yes, this pearl is off here with the little flower head. I do have it. So it was included. They didn't know what these were, but they are proudly marked Miriam Haskell. They are both rhinestone and faux pearl. Very large, very A-line. Um, the best of Haskell that you can find um, in earrings. And those were a moderate, I believe, $20 or $28. They weren't much. Uh, but again, once I wire that back in place, uh, it's going to be a beautiful pair of earrings. So there was those. And then in the same line of costume, I don't normally steer towards costume right now. There are the clip earrings. And of course, we would know by the back and the way they're constructed that they are d and &E. um, When people throw terms around of d and &E, Juliana, you know, those kind of things, we have to be slightly more careful um, because this is definitely a Juliana necklace produced by D&E, but D&E did produce things 
for, I believe it was Weiss and Kramer um, and different companies. So you can't always say in construction that something is Juliana, but definitely this um, is for sure Juliana. Unfortunately, the redstone in the earring has gone a little bit dark, so that needs to be addressed. And then one of the rhinestones, yeah, that one right there, has gone a little gray in the necklace, but what an incredible choker. And this was very moderately priced, but this is a telltale Juliana construction. So whenever you see this, and you see it as a bracelet or a necklace, that is definitely a Juliana construction, 100%. And we all know that now um, in the business. So um, very beautifully done. And again, it was so moderately priced um, and just need to address that. And I'll get into repairs on things eventually, uh, but I wanted to show that. And then this, um, this was something that again, probably most people would just walk right by, not even worry about. This was in one box. And this was in another box. So these two things were in two separate boxes. Everything was a dollar. So immediately as carved wood, I went crazy for this. Either two dogs or two bears um, kissing each other. And um, with the you know pin back, that's 1940s. And you can see right here is a remnant of a, an elastic cord or an elastic thread. And this door would have been on elastic thread. And then this Bakelite hasp over here would then move and swing freely. So this door would then hinge open as you were wearing it and be spring loaded. So then it would just go right back. So you could open the door to show someone the two animals inside kissing each other, a moment of affection, and then the door would close. What a whimsical, whimsical, fun, beautiful brooch. And I didn't pay $2. I talked her into just giving me the door so I could put it back together. So it was only a dollar. And again, that one, you know, online, I could get 85 or 95, but I wouldn't want to sell it because it just brings me so much happiness. So that wooden pin made me very happy. And then um, I'm still scrounging. Oh, this is beautiful. Not necessarily important, but look at the stones in this one. Sterling silver. And I believe this was $10 or $12, but really, really well done. Look at the stones. Citrine, amethyst, blue topaz, peridot, and garnet. Um, but just really well constructed. Rhodium finished sterling. Double locking mechanism. And totally right. So that was a yes because, again, the color, the saturation of the stones, the quality, everything said yes to me, and the price was a for sure. Um, didn't even really need to think about it. Um, this one, I didn't necessarily consider it important, but I most certainly knew that I could sell it. So again, do we want to call it iris glass? Um, sure, I, I wouldn't, you know, argue about that, but it is glass, and the stones have the blue, pink, and faint green, kind of in the pastel family on these, but beautiful, and a Victorian Renaissance um, metalwork with little uh, faux pearls. And it's it's um, not that it's a no one, but it's not signed. Um, we do have a slight attribution on these. I'm not going to get into that yet because we're not sure as collectors or historians. So we'll get into that in future videos when we're 100% sure. But right at the 1940s, 1950s, great movement, great color. Uh, again, it was very inexpensive. It was $8. And I was tempted to leave it because I didn't feel it that important. But I knew that I could sell it for maybe, you know, $25 or $35. Um, this is a Kramer of New York. It's signed here. It's rhodium plated, but opalescent stones. And again, historically important. Nope, not really, but beautiful, well-crafted and sellable. Sure. Absolutely. Years ago, these were 95, 125. Now they're down to, you know, they're down to a more moderate price because people understand they're just costume. It's just glass. Uh, they're beautiful, but that one would probably be in the range of maybe 45 to $55 now. So not, you know, life altering, um, you know, when it comes to costume, but beautifully made um, and something that I bought because I knew I could make money. These bags are completely full and going to drive me absolutely crazy, but um, these are sterling silver salts. Um, and, you know, I didn't think they were sterling at first. I thought they were silver plated just because the color of the metal and the oxidation. But in fact, they are sterling. And these were um, $3 a piece. Little dolphin feet on them, open salts. And then right here, you can kind of see the hallmarks. Um, and again, 
very faintly done, but you have the light rampant facing left, which is Sterling. And then all these other marks are date letters and um, the company that constructed them. And then that uh, hallmark, I'm not sure exactly what that is, but I'll look up, look it up. I'll um, kind of probably maybe kind of lightly polish this one just a little bit to bring it back to the surface of the other two, but really beautiful craft and really beautiful construction and very heavy. So just in metal, probably worth between 45 between 45 and 48 dollars just in metal so the nine dollars i spent well spent yet again you know but again resale but fantastic and uh at don scott and then let me get into oh um oh the ones that i really love um i'm holding out on you here to keep you until the end of the video video 45 minutes in so i want to kind of you know get this done uh this is a bohemian garnet brooch Again, Victorian era, so right around 1895 to 1915. Again, the pin mechanism and the clasp over here, you can tell that this is original as a tube hinge, no problem there. The riveted construction completely correct for that time period, so each layer is riveted together. This definitely looks as a replacement. So this fold over, more indicative of 19, I believe that's 1910 or 1915, again, from my memory, but we'll get into clasp mechanisms eventually and I'll clarify all that information for you but definitely bohemian rose cut garnets and really really good color and um, remarkable that they were all still there so an oversized star and this was only $80 so that was a have to have because garnets have really maintained their value and continue to go up and I can see why one of the things that I really really loved that I'm on the fence about keeping and I probably will keep it um, is this oversized Sized, let me put the pin in here, oversized swallow brooch. So we have this incredible opalescent enamel. So a slightly texturized surface underneath, which could be boss tie enamel. And again, boss tie is not something that most people know about, but as a jewelry historian, you know, I know just a little bit more about the technique that went into these things. So we have this beautiful glass enamel, small cabochon garnet eye, and paste rhinestones that then accentuate the wings. Look at the enameling though. It is so beautiful and so wonderful. Um, $68. Um, I would have paid upwards to 300 to maybe 375 uh, and I would still consider that a bargain. Um, and I did get a discount on this. Um, I didn't ask, but the dealer did volunteer a discount, so I took it. And it is signed on the back, Deposé and Sterling, and the maker's mark is right there. And since, again, I've only owned it for about 20 five or 28 hours <laughs> I will do or maybe it's 36 now who's counting right um after all I just don't sleep so an early early mechanism for the clasp so just a fold over um and then the pin stem comes out there so you can put it on but look how large it is I believe that's about three that's about three and a half almost four inches across and the enameling is literally perfect um just really beautifully done um and a uh, treasure to behold so i love that uh, oh and uh i don't think i gave a circuit date on that but definitely art nouveau um 1900 let's just say um on to this bag of goodies i guess i should just spill this out because all right i'm going to bear with me one second um this all came from another dealer and um oh what a mess i should have bagged these up all right so the first piece, sterling silver and um, crystal, and I just love the design of it. Signed on the inside, and it's a pendant. You can wear it in any direction. That was only $10. So that was a yes. Beautiful. And then this one is um, kyanite, um, kyanite blue lace agate cultured pearl, and that's it. So um, it's a beaded tassel. Let me, <laughs> what a mess. This is an absolute wreck. Um, <laughs> sorry about this. Uh, I, <laughs> I need a bigger box. Um, um, this necklace goes on forever. Here's the tassels at the bottom. And then these are pearl. Those are kyanite. Uh, beautiful kyanite. And then cultured pearl. There's your blue lace agate faceted. So this is a great big long kind of lariat style necklace. So you can wear this and then kind of bypass the tassels. Let me see. <laughs> what a wreck. 
Uh, <laughs> okay, so there is the tassels at the end, so you can kind of bypass the design and then slip it over your head. But really fashionable, and that was like reminiscent of J. King or Mind Finds, uh, one of those. And um, it was only $20. So just in gemstones, I knew I couldn't buy that for less. And then we had these two. Um, this one is Nolan Miller. I normally don't get into Nolan Miller, but um, this was a have to have because I know it'll sell. And then this Art Deco bracelet, um, channel set, beautiful engraving on the sides, beautiful jet stones. And what's great about this is the wider version. So this, I believe, is maybe the medium version in width, because I have seen wider. Um, and then it's signed sterling on the inside there. And then it hinges open. Customarily, these are missing one or two stones, because they're just basically tension set. Uh, so each one's reliant on the next one. And then the bezel is closed and tightened from the outside. So if one goes, most of the time two goes. Um, but again, these are just faceted glass. Um, but beautifully done. And that was only $30. Um, those customarily still are going for around 120 to maybe 125 you know, retail. Um, so I knew that there was space for me to make money on that. And then um, this one is Nolan Miller. And again, I don't normally buy Nolan Miller items, but uh, beautifully executed, signed on the back. And the construction, and I think the mixture of materials, you know, it was a nod to, I don't want to say Alexis Batar, but um, it's very, um, you know, high style, like Alexis Batar's work, which, you know, is revered by collectors, and I can see why. Um, very beautifully done. Uh, and I love the color, and I love the three flowers. Um, but again, very sellable. So there was that. And then the only other bag, I am still an absolute wreck over here. The only other bag is this one. And this is just, again, this is just resale for me. But um, let me see if I can just leave it in the bag. Sorry about the mess. These things were all contemporary. So Mother of Pearl inlay, sterling silver. The original price was $172, and I paid $10 for that. So that was a yes for $10. I couldn't even make it for less than probably $50 at this point. Beautiful shell with inlay. Remarkable thing. So that's a sell. And then this, I think, is Rialos. Um, is that right? Rialos? Carolyn Pollock, I'm drawing a blank over here because I don't do contemporary. I just don't do it. It is signed there with the hallmark. Um, and I, I have to say, I don't care who it is, but uh, Sterling Silver Brass and Onyx, um, an enhancer, but, you know, remarkable thing in terms of what it is. So that was a sell, and that was, again, $10. I would not have paid more than 10 for it just because I don't do contemporary, and yet I have a whole bag of contemporary jewelry. <laughs> I make no sense. Anyways, this is Amethyst and sit, um, Amethyst and CZ. It does need to be cleaned. Um, I didn't clean any of this yet, but this, again, was um, $15, and I can't can't buy a gem grade amethyst that large for $15. And then Mojave Turquoise and Amethyst in Sterling Silver, totally correct. Artisan signed, enhancer, beautiful stones, beautiful execution. And again, that was $8. So for $8, yes, you know. Um, you know, is it an investment piece? No, <laughs> but it was still very sellable. This one is black spinel. Um, and I loved the three stone design. Very, very, very beautiful stones. Needs to be cleaned, but again, just right out of the show. And that was $10, fully articulated. This one is an amethyst. Um, and crystal. Uh, again, this was $8. Totally correct for silver. I will test everything, but I can tell by the solder eutectics that this is not plated. It's genuine. And a checkerboard cut amethyst of really deep saturation. Um, this one was unusual enough that I like the mixture of stones. You know, I'm a little bit difficult when it comes to putting stones together, but these made sense. Um, the craft was good. Um, it is fully hallmarked. A pendant and a pin, so versatile wear. So that was definitely something that I knew a retail customer would enjoy. This one, Mother of Pearl, and then um, tourmaline. Green, pink, and yellow tourmaline stones on a Mother of Pearl heart, sterling silver frame. Really beautiful thing. And then this one, this one got me. This is also sterling, but look at the abalone. My gosh. Um, 
It's mosaic inlay, but the color play of the abalone, this would actually be something I would consider wearing. Um, and, you know, it kind of goes against all I say about uh, contemporary, but um, I guess I have a double standard because I would absolutely positively wear this. I'd probably only wear it once or twice and then say it's time to sell it. Um, and then there is this bracelet appears to be a blue zircon not exactly sure gonna have to do some research on that could be blue topaz but a hinged bracelet to get on much larger size as well which is very sellable right now and um beautiful side stones as well beautiful work and then let's see it's um there was one other really good one in here and oh well um i'll find it later i guess um and then there is this one so we've got some sort of really Quite special and unusual stone in the center. Got to look at that closer. Faux turquoise would be my guess, or stabilized at least. And then amethyst and half seed pearls in sterling silver. Beautiful chain. And that one was $15. And I said to myself, I can't even get the stones or the sterling to make that for $15, let alone a 20-inch chain that's fully hallmarked on the back. So um, incredible. Oh, here, uh, these two rings. Um, I guess I will show you these. Um, I don't know why I bought these. <laughs> <laughs> but this was probably, an, oh, I remember why, because this is freaking fantastic. So artisan made, look at the mounting. Um, and this other uh, one is CZ, but looks like a yellow diamond. Uh, very 40s, 50s in design. And only $20. Uh, it was $25, and I got it for $20. But very realistic. You know, looks like a yellow diamond. Uh, and who wouldn't want to buy that to not uh, jeopardize wearing a real yellow diamond that large? And then uh, sterling silver constructed on this. I got this one for $20 dollars beautiful stone uh, needs to be cleaned again um, I wish I had a thing to wipe it off but oh well forget it um, and then sterling silver hand constructed and um, just a beautiful thing beautiful ring um, so that was a yes let me clear this out for one second and show you the final piece that um, really, uh, and there's a ton more stuff in this box. There's a, a jade stone uh, that was unmounted, and, and that was a yes. Um, I'll have to find something to do with that. Oh, this guy, I'm sorry about this length of this video. Um, Moonstone Sterling Silver Crayfish, that was a yes. That was an absolute, oh my God, have to have. So that was a yes. And then um, this was a yes. And this other one was a yes because I'm a sucker for enameling. And this was such an unusual color, a toggle clasp. Definitely, um, let's see what we've got for a signature. I thought it was Norway. It probably is. Um, Denmark, Norway. Um, Denmark. There we go. Sterling Denmark. Um, and look at the chartreuse enamel leaves. Um, beautiful condition, too. I didn't find anything wrong with this. And usually there's some sort of chip or nasty wear to uh, these enameled pieces because there's no counter enamel on these. And this one was perfect. I found no imperfections in the enamel. And I mean, is that dirt? Yeah, that's just gummy dirt. That's just... Um, that's, I don't know, disgusting is what that is. <laughs> and then um, I'll, I'll get this all cleaned up eventually. But beautiful enameling. Absolutely beautiful. I guess I should clean the things before I come on. And then the grand finale, since you all have waited with me, I have two more to show. And then we're going to call it a day. I think this is the most... This is the longest video I've ever done. This is Marius Hammer. And uh, Marius Hammer was a turn-of-the-century producer. Um, it is fully marked. Let me open this up right here. It is fully hallmarked right there. So there is the M with the hammer. That is Marius, M-A-R-I-U-S or M-A-R-I-S, um, Hammer, and then 925. So it might be Morris Hammer, but I always thought it was Marius. Um, but maybe it's Morris Hammer. I'll have to look that up. Interesting that I may have just made a total blunder. Um, but there is Galoshi enamel, um, Gishe enamel. On um, Here I go tripping over the most simple of terms. I don't know what my problem is, but probably that I haven't had a break for 57 minutes. Um, so enamel, 
and just remarkable glass enamel and um, a simple clasp on, on that side. But the brooch would be right around 1900, maybe 1910. But look at the enameling. So I'll have to have a pronunciation class. Guilloche, galoche. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I don't know what my problem is. And then this fitted box. <laughs> I love making fun of myself. Um, there's this fitted box. And inside... One of the most remarkable bracelets. Um, it is 14 and 18 karat gold. Um, it, the bracelets from around 18, this is tough, 1865 to 1870. Um, it does have its marks in the bottom there. And then it also has its safety and it is a larger wrist size. So it does open. Let's try and open this. I can't believe I'm still stuck on the fact that I tripped over the most easy of enameling terms. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, uh, there we go. All right. So it does have um, a very strong clasping mechanism. So that's wonderful that that's still in place because sometimes those are really broken. And then look at the gold work. And then you've got these remarkable clean diamonds and a natural, natural sapphire in the center. Um, this one spoke to me from across the room. I knew for a fact it was coming home and, of course, nestled in a fantastic, fantastic early fitted box uh, with its original clasping mechanism on the side. So can you imagine uh, the person that received this as a gift back then? Just an absolute beautiful thing um, that really spoke to me as um, one of the finest I had seen. And um, the stone quality and the gold workmanship, uh, the fact that this has survived so beautifully with these applied uh, granules of gold um, and just the care that it took to do these bell flowers down the sides, uh, the rope twist on the top here, again, just something so incredibly, incredibly special um, and knew that that had to come home with me. So that completes the video for now. There are 8 million more things <laughs> sitting on my desk that I wish I could talk about. Oh, and before I go, um, my, my normal ring and then um, my octopus, um, the Jonathan Lau octopus that converts to a pendant because you guys always ask what I'm wearing um, in the videos. Oh, and uh, this bracelet. I bought this at Don Scott as well. Um, Sterling silver turquoise but I just loved it you know it was one of those things that I had seen it the last time I was there and it was my friend Kay's and um, I just had to buy it so um, my octopus and then like I said this does I don't think I've ever shown this before but the mechanism on the back um, does this does open um, so this opens up and then the um, the ring shank kind of mouse traps off. It's got this little knob that then goes into the center there. And then this closes back down. And then you can run a chain through here. So he would be he or she would be at an angle on a necklace. But um, champagne diamonds. Uh, fancy orange sapphire and then look at the detail on the suction cups with the tiny little bezel set diamonds um jonathan lau's work um he is and was a master of um such things and i have a snake ring of his uh, that i bought at the ix center gem show the international gem show when it came in um and then i couldn't decide what ring finger i wanted this octopus for so i had two shanks made it was this size and then i also had one made that was smaller so i could wear it on my ring finger on this hand. So I had two different 18 karat gold shanks made. Uh, and this is 18 karat white gold. And like I said, fancy color diamonds, um, orange sapphire, yellow sapphire, and uh, remarkable diamonds. And look at the way the tentacles move. Uh, but Jonathan did an amazing job. A uh, highly, highly collectible artist. And you can see why. So fantastic. All right, I'm going to say that's it. And you know how I end this. Um, you bared with me for a whole hour. I hope you enjoyed this. I will be back this week with another video. And you know how I end this. I love you. Don't forget that. Let me say it one more time. I love you very much.